Romans 11, 25 to 26. Here's what it says. For I do not want, brethren, you to be uninformed of this mystery so that you will not be wise in your own estimation that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved. This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. Those are the opening words for each of the episodes of Unsolved Mysteries. The docudrama ran from 1987 to 1997 on NBC and then again for another two years on CBS. The latest version was picked up by Netflix in 2000, or 2020. Now the program features reenactments of unsolved uh, murders, missing persons, unexplained paranormal phenomena like alien abductions, ghosts, and UFOs. Now Merriam-Webster's dictionary uh, defines a mystery as something that's beyond understanding or something that's secretive or a religious truth that can only be known by revelation and cannot fully be understood. Now theologians speak about the mystery of the Trinity. How is it that God can be one being and yet subsist in three persons? Or the mystery of the incarnation. How is it that Jesus can be truly God and truly man at the same time? These are mysterious truths that cannot be fully understood. But when the Bible uses the word mystery, it speaks of something that was previously hidden, but now has been revealed by God. King Nebuchadnezzar, he had a dream that troubled him greatly. So he called his fortune teller, psychics, and astrologers together to interpret the dream. No problem, O king. Just tell us the dream and we'll tell you the interpretation. <laughs> no, no, no. We're going to try a different approach this time. I'm not going to tell you what the dream was. You're going to tell me what I dreamt. That way I'll know that your interpretation is correct. You can't ask us to do that. That's outrageous. No king has ever made such a request of his magicians. Yeah, well, I'm not requesting, I'm demanding. And if you don't declare the content of my dream and its interpretation, I'm going to kill all of you. Well, Daniel, when he heard that, being one of the court advisors, went to the captain of the bodyguard and told him that he would tell the king his dream and give him the interpretation. He just asked that he would be granted a little time. And when he was, he called together a prayer meeting with his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, so, quote, they could, uh, might request compassion from the God of heavens concerning this mystery, so Daniel and his friends would not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. That night, Daniel had a dream himself, and in his dream, the content and the meaning of the king's dream was revealed to him. Daniel thanked God for his goodness and went off to talk to the king. The king said to Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, are you able to make known to me the dream that I had and its interpretation? Daniel answered before the king and said, as for the conjurers, or as for the mystery about which the king has inquired, neither wise men nor conjurers nor magicians nor diviners are able to declare it to the king. However, there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will take place in the latter days. This was your dream and your vision and your mind while you were on your bed. As for you, O king, while you were on your bed and your thoughts turn to what would take place in the future, and he has revealed mysteries and has made known what will take place. But as for me, the mystery which uh, has been revealed uh, to me was not because of any wisdom residing in me more than any other living man, but for the purpose of making the interpretation known to the king that you may understand the thoughts of your mind. Daniel then goes on to declare the interpretation to the king. Now notice in this story that Nebuchadnezzar's dream was called a mystery. It was something beyond his understanding. It was something secretive, something he wasn't even going to tell others. And it was a mystery in the sense that it could not be understood except for by revelation from God. So a mystery in the Bible is some truth that was previously hidden from men but now revealed by God. And there's a lot of places where the Bible talks about mysteries. Jesus spoke of the mystery of the kingdom. Paul spoke of the mystery of iniquity that now works in the world, connected with the Antichrist. Also spoke of the mystery of godliness. The very existence of the church as a body of believers is called a mystery. Christ himself is called God's mystery. And that Christ indwells the hearts of all of his children, his believers, that also is called a mystery. 
Well, here today we have another mystery. It's a mystery relating to the way God is going about saving Gentiles and then ultimately will turn back to save the Jews as well. And so today, to help us understand this wonderful and mysterious way of God and how he keeps his promises, we want to consider this portion of his word this morning. So why don't we pray and get into the text. Father God, I do pray for grace and mercy. Help us to see this. If it's true that uh, mysteries are those things that you reveal, then we need your spirit to reveal these things to us. Not just in our mind, Lord, but in our hearts so it becomes life transforming. So I pray that you do that for us. And we ask now in Jesus' name, amen. Well, to outline this, if you want to write down three phrases, I think it'll cover the sermon. The first phrase you can write down is a partial hardening. A partial hardening. The next phrase you can write down is the fullness of Gentiles. The fullness of the Gentiles. And the third is the phrase, all Israel will be saved. All Israel will be saved. So partial hardening. For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery so that you will not be wise in your own estimation that a partial hardening has happened to Israel. Have you ever heard that saying, ignorance is bliss? <laughs> the phrase actually comes from Thomas Gray, a poet back in 1768. The full line is where ignorance is bliss, to be, it is folly to be wise. Now, back in 1962, America and, and Russia squared off in what was dubbed the Cuban Missile Crisis. For 13 tense days, American parents were living in fear of a, what might turn out to be a nuclear exchange. Remember duck and cover? Well, the kids, too young to understand, they were all playing outside unaware and unconcerned of what was taking place. King Solomon said that to increase wisdom is to increase distress. I keep giving books to one of the ladies in our Bible study so she can read and become like the men of Issachar who understand their times. But she tells me the more she reads, the more stressed out she gets. Now, ignorance may be bliss in some limited cases, but folks, listen, it's never bliss when it comes to understanding the ways of God. Paul didn't want the Gentiles in the church in Rome to be ignorant and uninformed of this mystery so that you will not be wise in your own estimation. Paul worried that their ignorance would actually lead to arrogance against the Jews so that they would think too highly of themselves, the Gentiles would, and too lowly of the Jews. And so the first part of the mystery is that a partial hardening has happened to Israel. Now there's certain ailments that involve the hardening of various parts in the Bible. There's scleroderma, which is a hardening of the skin. I'll get these wrong, the pronunciation, I'm sorry. Arthiosclerosis, the hardening of arteries. Multiple sclerosis, which is the damaging of the nerve endings. Now, when Paul speaks of Israel's condition here of hardening, it's a spiritual multiple sclerosis that's affected their hearts and their minds and their eyes and their ears. Do you remember what God, when God sent Isaiah to preach to the people? He told them that they wouldn't repent. But God said to, to Isaiah, he said, tell this to the people, keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but don't understand. And then he said to Isaiah, render the hearts of these people insensitive, their ears dull and their eyes dim. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and return and be healed. And back in chapter 11, 7 to 10, Paul, in explaining why some Jews have believed in Jesus while the majority have not, asked this question. He said, what then? What Israel was seeking they did not obtain? But those who were chosen, meaning the elect, did obtain it. And the rest, meaning the rest of the Jews, were hardened. But as it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that do not see, ears that do not hear, down to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a retribution to them. Let their eyes be darkened to see not and bend their backs forever. I have to tell you, the idea that God softens some hearts while he hardens others is one that's difficult to understand, but it's even more difficult to accept. But in softening some and hardening others, God has done nothing wrong because that is his right to do just that as the creator. As it says in Romans 9:18, he will has mercy on whom he desires and he hardens whom he desires. Now, when Paul says that a partial hardening has come upon Israel, he doesn't mean that the Jews are like 50% harder and responding to the gospel than other people. 
He's not talking about the level or degree of hardness, but the percentage of the nation that has been hardened. A portion of the nation has been hardened. I like the way the RSV translates it. It says, lest you be wise in your own conceits, I want you to understand this mystery, brethren. A hardening has come upon part of Israel. When Paul says that the hardening has come upon part of Israel, it's not the smaller part, though. It's the much greater part. The overwhelming number of Jews since the time of Jesus have rejected him as the Messiah, and as a result, they've perished in their sins. But God has always kept a remnant, according to grace, in every generation who's trusted Jesus so as to be saved, but the majority have experienced that judicial hardening. Israel has experienced the hardening, but it's not total. It's partial. And it's not permanent. Paul's going to argue it's temporary. Granted, it's been going on for 2,000 years, but it will end sometime in the future. How do we know that? Because of what we find in the next phrase, the fullness of the Gentiles. By the way, wasn't there a TV program called Full House? I think there's a, a movie, Full Metal Jacket. When somebody says something that gives indication that they're not mentally all there, they say, that guy's not playing with a full deck. If we don't believe the story that he's telling us, we say he's full of baloney. Or if he's Irish, we say he's full of blarney. Well, according to Paul, something has to be full before the hardness of the Jews is removed. He says this partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. Jesus was Israel's promised Messiah, the Son sent from heaven by the Father. But the Jews were looking for a military leader to rescue them from Rome, but Jesus was sent to rescue his people from their sins. You remember what the angel told Joseph, speaking to, uh, of Mary, told Joseph, he said, she shall have a son and you shall name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. But even at the very beginning, there was evidence that the Jews would reject him while the Gentiles would accept him. The Magi came from a thousand miles away to find he who was born king of the Jews. The scribes told the Magi where he would be born in Bethlehem, but there's no record that they themselves went to seek out this Christ child. And while Jesus wondered at the unbelief of his countrymen and says that he marveled at the faith of a Roman centurion, a Gentile, who was sure that Jesus would, or not only could heal his servant, but that he would if he just spoke the word. Now when Jesus heard this, we read, he marveled and said to those who were following him, truly I say to you, I have not found such great faith with anyone in Israel. I say to you, many will come from the east and the west, meaning the Gentile nations, and recline with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom, meaning the Jewish people, will be cast out into outer darkness in a place where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 11, 10 to 12. And after he was converted, the apostle Paul went from city to city, preaching in the synagogues that Jesus was the Christ. Time and time again, you had the same scenario. You would get a few Jews that would respond and a whole lot of Gentiles who would respond. And the Jews that rejected him, many of them persecuted Paul as he went from town to town. But God was using these events to bring the Gentiles into the church so that what started as a Jewish movement in Israel became an international church that includes 2.5 billion professed followers of Jesus. But today, even today, it's still a remnant of Jews who believe in Jesus, and they make up just a fraction of those who are in the church. And yet in this mysterious plan of God, Paul tells us that their transgressions as riches for the world and their failure was riches for the Gentiles. So at the present time, in this present age, where God is hardening the Jews, he's bringing many, many Gentiles into the church. And Paul tells us that things are going to continue this way until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. But what does that mean? And when do we reach that fullness? A lot of commentators say that when Paul says uh, that the hardening won't be removed until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, that, that that means that once the last Gentile saved who God intends to save, then the Jews will have their hearts softened and they also will believe as well. And that's why we send missionaries out to give the gospel to the four corners of the world so that the last Gentile gets saved, then the Jews can get saved and it all comes to an end. Those commentators who interpret it this way are amillennialists, and they do so because they don't believe in a future 
reign of Christ upon the earth. And as they understand it, Jesus comes back and he just separates the sheep from the goats, the believers from the unbelievers, puts the believers in hell and the unbelievers in heaven. So obviously there can't be anyone who gets saved afterwards. So it's the Jews, once they get saved, no more Gentiles saved after that. Kim Riddenbarger in his book, A Case for Amillennialism, thinks it's absurd to believe that people can be saved after Christ comes. I mean, he points out, he says, you know, you premillennialists speak of people being converted in a future reign of Jesus, but where, where are those people supposed to come from since all the believers will have been resurrected and all the unbelievers will have been cut down in the battle of Armageddon? Take your Bible, turn to Zechariah chapter 14. If you got one of the older Ryrie study Bibles, that's page 1476. <laughs> Zechariah 14. Where do you get those people from who are going to inhabit the earth? In the millennium, we find him in the Bible, right here. That's what it says. Isaiah chapter 14. Zechariah. Or Zechariah, I'm sorry. 14. It says, Behold, days are coming for the Lord, when the spoils taken from you, taken from the Jewish people, will be divided among you. For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city will be captured, the houses plundered, and the women ravished, and half of the city exiled, but the rest of the people will not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as when he fights on the day of battle. In that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. Now, who is he talking about? Now, I had one commentator who said, we can't take this passage literally because God doesn't have feet. Contraire, mon frere. Did Jesus not have feet? He left from the Mount of Olives. The angel said he's coming back to the same place he left. This is what it's talking about. So this is in the future when Jesus returns, right? And all the natures, nations are gathered against Jerusalem to destroy it. He goes on to say this, which is in front of Jerusalem in the east on the Mount of Olives will be split in the middle from the east to the west, a very large valley, so that the half the mountain will move to the north and the other half to the south. And you will flee by the valley of my mountains, for the valley of my mountains will reach to Azel. Yes, you will flee just as you fled the, before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come and all of his holy ones with him. By the way, who are the holy ones with him? That's the angels and us, the resurrected saints. Now this is clearly talking about Christ's return. The battle that is, uh, he's going out to fight against is the one that's mentioned in Revelation 19. Uh, what we know is the battle of Armageddon. Look at what it says in verse 6. In that day there will be no light. Uh, the luminaries will dwindle. For it will be a unique day which is known to the Lord, neither a day, of, uh, day nor night. But it will come about that at evening time it will be light. And in that day, living waters will flow out from Jerusalem, half of them towards the eastern sea and the other half towards the western sea. And so it will be in summer and is also in uh, winter. And the Lord will be king over all the earth. And in that day, the Lord will be the only one and his name the only one. Now notice where Jesus is reigning here. Not in heaven, but on earth. This is speaking of that future millennial reign of Christ, that thousand year reign of Christ on earth. Verse 10, all the land will be changed into a plain from Geba to Rimon of uh, south of Jerusalem. But Jerusalem will rise and remain on its site from Benjamin, the Benjamin Gate as far as the place of the first gate to the corner gate and from the Tower of Hananel uh, to the king's wine press. People will live in it and there will no longer be a curse for Jerusalem will dwell in security. Now skip down to verse 16. This is this. Then it will come about that any of those who are left of all the nations that went up against Jerusalem will go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to celebrate the Feast of Booths. And it'll be that whichever the families of the earth does not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, there will be no rain on them. If the family of the, uh, Egypt does not go up to, or to enter, then there will be no, no rain will fall on them. It will be the plague with which the Lord will smite the nations which do not go up to celebrate the Feast of Booths. Now, it's the armies of the nations that are destroyed at Armageddon. Not the inhabitants of the nations. Those who are left in all those nations and their descendants, those are the people that we as resurrected saints will rule over. Now notice they go up to Jerusalem to worship the Lord, some voluntarily and others involuntarily. Now I bring this passage of Zechariah into this place here in Romans 
to show that the fullness of the Gentiles cannot mean that all the Gentiles who will ever be saved will be saved before the Jews have the hardening removed from them. Because clearly there's Gentiles being saved here after Israel's redeemed. Well, that's what Paul is hinting at earlier. And by the way, there's going to be far more people who are saved in that age than saved in this age. And you can demonstrate that from a number of places in the Scripture. I think that's what Paul's talking about when he says, Now, if the riches, are, if their transgression is riches for the world, and their failure is riches for the Gentile, in other words, the Jewish rejection of Jesus and God's rejection of them, if that's brought riches to the Gentiles, how much more will their fulfillment be, their reconciliation? How much more will that be blessings for the Gentiles? Well, it will be the conversion of the nations. The fullness of the Gentiles is the full number of the Gentiles to come into the church in the present age. Well, that brings us to our third point then. All Israel will be saved. He says, For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery so that you will not be wise in your own estimation. By the way, what he's saying is that it's, the church is not the final end point of what God's doing. It's the salvation of Israel that's the final end point of what God's doing. That a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so, all Israel will be saved. Now you would think that that phrase, at least, so all Israel would be saved, since it's so simple and short and sweet, would be one where there's no disagreement by the commentators over it. But alas, that is not the case. Almost every word is debated in that phrase. I mean, the first words of the phrase, and so, and so, is translated in, by the NIV in this way. I think that's a good translation. But in what way is he saying that Israel is going to be saved? Does he, does he mean that the hardness of Israel will end, and, like, and, and then it will happen? The Greek word um, uh, hutos doesn't relate to time. It means uh, the, the manner it's done. But Paul has already told us that this will happen. The hardness will continue until. So there's a time element here. So if, if, if you were told to stay at your job until the next crew comes in, you would know you're not free to leave until they come in to replace you. If our government officials tell you that you only have to wear a mask and social distance uh, for two weeks until we get the, the, the curve bent a little bit, why well, you would know that after two weeks you're free to go back to your normal life. Unless it was two months or two years or two decades or... The reason people are upset is because the word until implies that there will be an ending to it. And what about the words all, as in all Israel will be saved? Does that mean every Jew in every age is going to be saved? Or every Jew, or is it every Jew when Jesus returns, will all and each Jewish person be saved? And who's included in the term Israel? A lot of the Reformed commentators say that Israel refers to all God's people, Jew or Gentile. It's just another way of speaking of the church. Is that what's going on here? Let's tackle these questions. Let's do them in reverse order. Here's the first one. Who is Paul referring to when he speaks of Israel? Who is he referring to? Is Paul just using this word as another term for the church? No, I don't think so. As we've gone through chapters 9 to 11, we've seen that Paul has mentioned Israel 15 times and used the phrase Jew or Jews twice. In every one of these places, except here, it's quite clear that Paul is speaking about ethnic Jews, the physical descendants of the patriarch Jacob, whom God changed his name to Israel. Now look at verse 25 again. For I do not want you to be, I, I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you might not be wise in your own estimation that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Now in this verse, it must be that he's speaking about ethnic Jews who are unbelieving, right? They're the ones that have a partial hardening coming on them so that the Gentiles can come in. So clearly they're not the Gentiles. If the Gentiles are here and the Jews are here, they're not the same group, okay? And he says, and then he goes on to in the very next verse and say, and so all Israel will be saved just as it is written. Now here's what I'm asking you. What's the likelihood that Paul in verse 25, when he uses the word Israel, is speaking of ethnic Jews, but when he goes to the next verse, and he uses the word Israel again, he means it's something completely different. That's called equivocating, and it's a no-no. If I said to you when I uh, went outside the other day, it was freezing, and I ran out of the house bare-skinned because I had no clothes on, but while I was out there, I wasn't cold because I had bare skin on, you would rightly accuse me of confusing my terms when I'm talking about bare in each one of those, right? 
Well, that would be called equivocating. And Paul isn't equivocating when he speaks of Israel in verse 25 and then again in 26. He means ethnic Israel, the physical descendants of Jacob. That's what he's talking about, the future redemption of the Jews as a people. Second question, though, what does Paul mean when he says that all Israel will be saved? Does he mean that every single Jew who ever lived will be saved? Does he mean that all the Jews who are alive when Jesus comes back, all of them will be saved? No, he can't mean that. He can't mean every Jew will be saved because he told us earlier that his heart was broken because his people were perishing. And we're told that though the number of the sons of Israel will be like the sand of the sea, it's the remnant that will be saved. So a majority of them are not going to be saved. Does he mean just that trickle of Jews that's come into the church over the centuries? If that's what Paul is saying, there's no mystery about that. Everyone in Paul's day could see that there were at least a few Jews being saved. I think what Paul is telling us here is that after the fullness of the Gentiles are saved, then God's going to lift the blindness and hardness of heart of the Jews and those from the 12 northern tribes, who we don't even know where they are, so that the majority of those who are still alive after the tribulation will be saved. And from that day forward, not only they, but all of their descendants who are born to them will end up saved. I take that from Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34, which promises the new covenant where God says this, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand and to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel in those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their hearts I will write it. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They shall not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquities and their sins. I will remember no more. Now, in the rest of verse 26, Paul proves his position that all of Israel is going to be saved in the end by quoting from a couple verses in the Old Testament where he says, The deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with him when I take away their sins. Now, there's a whole lot to unpack in those two prophecies. So we're going to come back to that next week where I'm going to show you from a number of Old Testament texts the sequence of events that surround the redemption of Israel and how the Bible lays out how it takes place in relationship to the Antichrist. But for right now, let's just make some application as we finish up here from our text. Here's the first thing I think we can say. God keeps his promises. God keeps his promises. Not only will he keep all of his promises to the nation of Israel, but he will keep his promises to those of us in the church. And here's what I'm telling you. You need to know those promises to believe in them, and to use them as an anchor for your soul in troubled times. I mean, let me give you just a couple. Are you worried about your financial situation? Some of you are facing losing your job. We don't know how the Supreme Court's going to ultimately rule on this. You heard that they locked people in their homes in Austria. They said by February, every person has to be immunized. We don't know what's going to happen. But you know what? Jesus reminded people in his day, he said, your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things, but seek first the kingdom of God and all its righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Hebrews 13, 5 says this, let your character be free from the love of money, being content with what you have, for he himself has said, I will never leave you, nor will I ever forsake you. you struggle with temptation, giving in to sin, 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says this, No temptation has overtaken you but what is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able to endure. But with each temptation, he'll provide a way of escape also that you may endure it. Or as Psalm 84, 11 says, For the Lord is the sun and the shield. The Lord gives grace and glory. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. You see, the lure of sin is it promises you something it's never going to deliver. The way you overcome sin and the lure of it is to find something that has a stronger pull on your life, something that can give you a superior pleasure. And that passage tells you that if you walk uprightly, God's not going to withhold anything from you that's good. Are you discouraged in ministry, wondering if 
your efforts are ever going to bring fruit? Galatians 6, 9 says, Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not grow weary. Hebrews 6, 10, For God is not unjust. He will not forget how hard you have worked for him and how you have shown your love to him by caring for other believers, as you still do. Here's a second thing, though, we can give by way of application. God is working out his program over many years. Thousands of years in the case of Israel. And he's working out his plan for your life over a lifetime. I mean, even if his ways seem mysterious and you don't understand what God is doing, he knows what he's doing. And we know that he causes all things to work for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Here's what I'm saying. God will fulfill his purpose for Israel, and God will fulfill his purpose for you. All we have to do is trust him. That's it. That's it. Let's pray. Our Father and God, even if we're not facing scary things now, we will be sometime probably in the very near future. And in the midst of that, we need to know that you have a plan, that you're working your plan, that nothing can thwart your plan, and that it's a good plan that will bring great blessings to us and glory to your Son. We pray, Father and God, that you'd help us to trust you in the midst of all these things so that we can be pleasing to you. And we pray for the nation of Israel, Lord. You promised that you'd always maintain at least a remnant, and we pray that that remnant would grow up until the time when Jesus returns when you save all of Israel. So bless us now, we ask in Christ's name. Amen.